Yo, what is up, guys? Snap here. Today, we're going to be talking about everything Necropolis League. It's going to be a long one today. We're going to be going over all of the builds, any relevant changes to all of them, our strategy throughout the league, how much we farmed, how it changed, all of that good stuff. There are timestamps down in the description if you want to jump to a particular topic. Not every topic might be relevant to you. So if you want to hear about a particular thing, I highly recommend just scrubbing through the video, go through the timestamps, so you can kind of hear the topics you'd like to hear about. Anyways, let's jump right into it. So first things first, after the seven day push, we made a total of 34 mirrors, a headhunter, and all of the divines you see here. This is a diagram of what everybody received in the party. As we have three traders, they receive a pretty big portion of the split. And then we have all the mappers down here all receiving an equal split at the bottom. The traders do receive a larger proportion of the split as a percentage because, hey, at the end of the day, we want them to stick around. Finding good traders is a dime a dozen and you definitely want to pay them handsomely. So they do want to keep coming back, if you know what I mean. There's a lot more interesting stats we can go over. Empyrean Gaming here, our good friend has gone over a lot of these on Twitter. I'll be linking to this particular thread if you want to kind of you know go over all of the different kind of div per hour that kind of thing it's a very good post here i recommend giving it a quick read through if you're interested a couple highlights here is basically if we include mirror appreciation we're making around 17 div per hour if you exclude mirror appreciation we're making around 13 divs per hour quickly going over the strategy that we landed on after experimenting with all the new stuff in the league uh, the strategy of course is mostly the same in terms of the passive tree the basics are we take all of the map mod effect all of the quant all of the pack size up here for conch and eldritch pack size up here. The big shift in maps that we did from previous leagues to this league was that it is now able to do eight mod conqueror maps, but also unID'd. So there's a new cartography scarab, which guarantees the map to drop with corrupted eight modifiers. But the difference is this league with this scarab, the maps drop unID'd. So that means you can benefit from the huge pack size and quantity you get from eight mods, but also you get the 30 quantity bonus that you receive for putting in the map unID'd. So you can benefit from both, whereas before you couldn't. This leads to a much higher baseline quantity of the map as well as really really high pack size because you're still running eight mod and so now you don't actually have to choose between going eight mod and unid maps because now you can just do both so the tree is just grabbing a bunch of map mod effect you get a bunch of delirium of course because you're going to want to be guaranteeing delirium mirror on the map one thing to mention here is that we tried doing five orbs and then corrupting them for eight mods but i think that the unid bonus plus deli mirror is going to be a little bit better there it takes way too many deli orbs to purchase and then corrupt them all to eight mods you're just kind of burning supplies and i don't think the delirium bonus is so good that missing out on the 30 map iiq from going unid'd is worth having to buy that many deli orbs so i think a better route to go down is to force delirium mirrors via the passive tree and then benefit from eight mod and unid'd and then finally you craft beyond now after you've taken all the map mod effect you don't have a lot of points left over you can really afford to put on maybe a few mechanics without having to path far around now of course there are a lot of really good juicer mechanics that add a lot of mobs like abyss and breach and that kind of thing but unfortunately we are way 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 too point starved to put all of those points on the tree so other mechanics like blight alva and ritual make the cut simply just because it has extremely good pathing with all of the map mod effect on the tree already first off we can explain the choice of alva this node time dilation has always been insane because it spawns so many blue mobs now the problem with this obviously in the past is that wandering path existed and you just simply had to click wandering path to benefit from all of that map mod effect so stuff like this just was not viable the removal of wandering path of course makes stuff like this amazing and it makes alva actually quite a good mechanic in the current meta and map atlas it also has very good pathing from the start here getting 40 percent chance and then finishing off all the increased chance down here guaranteeing four alvas you get more blue mobs it's just super super easy point efficient monsters you can add to the map next mechanic we're adding on is blight of course this is the same story as alva in that immune response is actually really crazy it can sometimes spawn 1000 even 2000 monsters in your map but unfortunately wandering path existed and now this node is crazy and you can click it because there's no more wandering path Additionally, once again, the pathing here is super, super nice for Blight. You can just grab all these points down here, grab the Blight chance up here, and you're already at 100%. So the pathing is super nice. Lastly, the worst mechanic we're probably putting on at the moment is going to be Ritual. Now, Ritual does spawn a lot of natural mobs. However, there's one really, really big downside with Ritual, and that is the respawning of mobs has a big quant penalty applied to them. It is significant, but overall, because this is the mechanic that we have to path around the least to, I think it is currently maybe the best thing you can put on your map. There might be a couple other permutations of, of some other mechanics, but essentially your div card atlas is going to be as much map mod effect quant as possible. And then you're just trying to jam on simply as many monsters as possible.
Ritual, and I think Blight and Alva do it best, and then Ritual is probably the best shoe-in mechanic at the end. But some people might figure out some other things to squeeze a little bit more mobs on, on average. The Scarabs here, of course, we ran were just quadruple divination Scarabs, and once again, the Conqueror map base was carrying the pack size, and overall, it was just a super, super good strategy. I'm super happy with it. It definitely outperformed our expectations to a degree. I wasn't expecting to get so much value from some of the div cards that seemed a little bit innocuous. And then finally, our favorite map list came down to this list of 12, which was Academy, Arsenal, Belfry, Cemetery, Defiled Cathedral, Maze, Mineral Pools, Phantasmagoria, Reef Shrine, Tower, Waterways. The worst map on here is probably honestly going to be either Mineral Pools or Waterways. Waterways is just contributing Humility cards. We were selling them for around 20C. However, at a certain point, Tabulas just become vendor fodder. And so this is probably going to switch around. Additionally, we were picking up Alchemy Orbs via the Survivalist card, which is on Mineral Pools. And that was because of the Gold Rush craze with the Alkin Go meta trying to fish for the Divines on the Necropolis mods. But obviously with that uh, being a little less popular now, the price of Alks has gone down. So that map is probably going to be rotated out. One important thing to mention here is that these maps are going to be constantly changing based off of the market as it's really easy for one of these things to crash and no longer become viable to put on your map. Um, and that brings us to one of the biggest shout outs of the league, and that is definitely going to be Nerdy Joe. Nerdy Joe, huge shout outs. He does a lot of PoE science in the Prohibited Library Discord. Uh, he definitely helped us out a lot finding out the, like the best cards to be running. He currently maintains a public spreadsheet of just like, you know, the various cards. He also has an open source program that you can use to try and determine the best cards. There's a Google sheet that he maintains here, which I'll link in the description here. You can also view the code here if you'd like. I mean, you can view the current best cards with or without the completion scarab if you're curious and running the curation scarab on your map. As with a lot of these tools, it is important to do your own due diligence because a lot of this stuff is very volatile in the market. The prices may be overvalued, undervalued. You need to, as a player, be able to evaluate the stuff that you're picking up is actually worth something because this list of 12 is very, very volatile. I cannot stress that enough. Anyways, that's enough about the profits, the strategy, that kind of thing. I want to quickly go over all of the builds. So this league, we decided to run a Bama Necromancer, and we honestly found pretty good success with it. There were basically no issues with the build. I have no complaints. It's able to do five orb delirium just fine. Uh, one thing from the POB to actually playing the build is obviously going to be the mana cost here. The mana cost on this skill is extremely high at 83. So the mana cost per second uh, is extremely high. This is very fixable with clarity from an aura bot. Just know that the mana can be a little bit hard to get under control without a clarity. If you have to, you can drop the dying sun here and just run around with a mana flask, which is what our carry ended up doing. We ended up carrying a mana flask 24 seven just because of no regen maps. We, obviously without no regen, you're not getting any mana back from the clarity from the aura bot. So you're forced to carry around a mana flask. And just in order to not have to swap gear so much for all of the unID maps that we're doing, we were just carrying around an eternal mana flask permanently. Additionally, we made a slight change on the six man carry. We ended up going for the bone barrier for the leech. And then obviously the ghost reaver for the insta leech. This is also very necessary for all of the crazy map mods that we're running as a result of having to run unID conk maps. This particular combo with Ghost Reaver and the Instant Leech on the Mastery here makes it so that you can run less recovery maps with all of the juice map mod effect. So while the bone offering here is more powerful, it also has increased duration. It is definitely bigger quality of life uh, to not have to drop two flasks when you roll the bad map mod and instead you just go Instant Leech here so you can have a more comfortable mapping experience when you have to run all of the crazy map mods as a result of the mods being unID'd. Other than that, there weren't a lot of crazy changes to the build here. We did get a very, very nice timeless jewel, of course. And in order to fit in all this leech stuff over here, we just dropped a couple small nodes in the larges over here. We did a little bit of different pathing here at the start to drop a few points. And overall, it's pretty much on par with what we, you know, POB'd. I think it performs super well. I don't have any complaints about the build. And it'll probably be the thing that we're playing in the future unless we see some really crazy specters come back into the mix. It is currently one of the strongest minion builds you can be playing. And the only incentive to switch off of something like this is for something a little more automated like specters but with the removal of hydra i just don't think it makes the cut i think we're probably going to be playing bama for the foreseeable future unless something really crazy gets added back like hydras anyways that's a quick tidbit about the bama build let's go over some changes to the aura bot here so in the video before the league i was stressing a lot about the timeless jewel and how the timeless jewel you buy will dictate what kind of aura bot you're building and where you're pathing because after all the timeless jewel is probably the hardest thing to buy and it's probably the most inconsistent thing about your build. So the Timeless Jewel that our trader bought was this four passive elegant hubris up here in the corner, and he managed to snipe it for 
survive chaos somehow. A big question mark on that one. And so I completely dropped the bottom section here, uh, which I, normally I'm pathing down the champion of the cause, but because we have the timeless jewel up here, I obviously have to make some adjustments. Now with this particular setup and you drop all the champion of the cause stuff, you have to shift your sockets around so that you're fitting an enlightened setup on the purities in your helmet instead of in a three link. This would normally be impossible because it's really hard to get the plus two for your purities in order to hit the 90 overcap breakpoint. But with the introduction of Darkseer into the mix, it gives you that global plus two skill levels to all of the spells. It makes it really, really easy for all of your purities to hit level 23. So that's one of the big changes here. Second big change to this Orbot was introducing the Tides of Time belt. Now, I think that this spell is extremely OP. It basically one-to-one -one replaces the Pathfinder Ascendancy. And when you get this belt, you can simply just drop the Pathfinder Ascendancy entirely and then just path down to champion for some more free aura effect because you no longer need to go Pathfinder once you have the belt. The four passive timeless here, as well as the champion node down here, gives me enough aura effect in order to not need a aura effect helmet here. So I've just opted to equip a vertex here. The vertex is really nice just because it has a lot of ES, has a lot of evasion. It also has chaos res, and it is an easy plus one for the sockets that are in your helmet here to give a plus one on the enlightened here to make your build a little bit cheaper. You're still using the blessing in the boots, which is March of the Legion, just to give a super, super, super juiced hatred to the moon. And you can also put your defiance banner in here to get a lot of defenses as well. As you can see in the sockets here, I have a level 32 defiance banner and a level 32 hatred. You can also put the Vol Smite in here if you'd like. One last change here is that I decided to drop the Intuitive Leap here, which might seem a little bit strange, but I do think it's necessary when you wear the belt. So normally to hit 100% uptime, you need to put Flask Mods on a rare belt. Now, obviously, if you're wearing a unique belt, you don't really have any more room to get Flask Mods. So I think a pretty easy place to get it is to just drop the Intuitive Leap here and path to a few more Dex nodes, which you can then tattoo for Flask Effect duration, as well as the Jewel Socket you're place to get another 10% flask duration and it's also an opportunity to get more mana reservation efficiency you can then just manually path down to influence or charisma down here rather and just grab another 10% increased flash charges gain to help your flask sustain on those minus flash charge maps now this is way over 100% sustain however I am planning to be able to run the worst map mods possible because once again we're running unid conqueror maps and we don't have any control over what map mods we're running so we need to be able to have extra sustain on all of the flasks this is also the reason why I take plus one max res here on the reservation mastery even though i'm already at 90 over cap it's just planning for rolling minus max on the unid maps this also helps with minus aura capping out is the most important thing so having that little extra max res is very helpful on those bad map rolls they're kind of the main changes to the aura bot all the other stuff should be pretty standard here I'm gonna move on to the curse bot not a ton to say about this build now obviously it's just turning on evil eyes for some increased damage taken you're running the few curses that you can run just to provide a little bit of extra damage via punishment and then you're running defensive curses via blasphemy and enfeeble and then you slap on utility like torrents reclamation and yeah this is just a super simple character um it doesn't have a lot going for it because we're using no pen curses but it is providing quite a lot with the belt it's providing a lot with the evil eyes it is providing a big defensive layer with enfeeble and temp chains Not a whole lot to say about the curse bot here it's basically just kind of one-to-one the pob from before the league so we will just move on to the mana guardian fortunately there also isn't a ton to talk about here with the mana guardian this build is this going to be a one-to-one -one POB from the pre-league? Uh, one thing to mention here is we were planning on trying to get the Grand Spectrum tattoos here on these large 30 nodes and getting a bunch of those, you know, extra mana, mana, mana. However, there was like two total tattoos indexed the entire week. Don't really know what was going on there, but those mana tattoos are just rare as fuck, I guess. Other than that, there weren't really any other adjustments here, of course. Let's talk about something interesting, which was actually the color here. Now, the color is interesting here because it no longer needs to get rarity on any piece of gear because we were just simply farming cards. If you're putting quadruple divination scarabs on your map, it is very, very low on the priority list to jam any amount of rarity on your gear and or the tree. Now, you still get it where you can on stuff like Greed's Embrace and also item rarity support is an easy shoe in. However, on the passive tree, you might opt to just take a lot of defenses to make your color even tankier because you really, really don't care about that extra maybe 200 rarity you get from jamming in a bunch of jewels simply just because you're missing the reliquary scarab. When you're doing the quadruple div strat, you are really just dropping no uniques. It is very noticeable. So we took the opportunity with all the extra points that we're normally gemming into voices just to grab more life suppression.
action and that kind of thing. And so you're on the ranger side of the tree here. You're just pathing to a bunch of life. You're getting suppressed capped and that's pretty much it. The gear of course is changing to go maximum quantity. So that means you need a quant helmet instead of going the ascetic route. And also because of that, you're going to be swapping your amulet to a quant great wolf and or a simplex amulet with quant. And then you're swapping out biscos for a string of servitude with quantity as well. We're just trying to max out the quant here because that's what affects the div cards. As that, there weren't a ton of adjustments to the color. It's just we're opting for more defenses instead of rarity and we're swapping out for quant wherever possible on the helmet the rings and the belt with all of the quant investment we're sitting at 132 quantity and 318 rarity and i do believe this does not take into account to wind ripper so we're really sitting on 147 percent rarity if the mob is frozen so switching to all the quant gear is substantial on the quantity and it's definitely something you want to pivot to if you're going for the card farming strat anyways moving on last but not least is going to be the minor support now this build is going to differ a lot from the pov I put out pre-league because obviously we don't need to ghost. I think ghosting is hardcore dead in its current state and I do not think it is very necessary to have a ghosting character so we have pivoted to just a straight minor support. Now a few interesting things about this build it is going to be a sabo of course because you're trying to get all of the increased effective aura on the mines here. Demolition specialist this carries the build. You anoint max mines you get the extra mines over here and then you get a bunch of master of commands for increased effective mines and then of course you're just tossing storm blast and portal mines to provide gigantic debuffs to the enemies one thing to mention here is the reliance on frost shield we do think that frost shield is an extremely good skill for staying alive so just casting this as much as possible very 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 good defensive layer that we didn't have before additionally this is a very good carrier of dark seer because you can put disorienting displays on your larges here you don't know disorienting display has a very insane radius it's like a screen and a half it is fucking massive and this blind works with the dark seer to provide malediction which is a 10 percent more damage multiplier and it's 10 percent less damage taken so this is very very good here additionally you grab a timeless jewel here just for the supreme ostentation because you're going to be walking around and being the sole carrier of garb of the ephemeral you can't put this on an ag but ags just die to detonate dead so you might as well just put it on this character it has a lot of es it's a very good chest it is extremely good because it makes it so you don't get slowed down by delirium it also makes it so you cannot take critical strikes additionally the last defensive layer we're bringing is going to be calm's bind which converts enemies uh, physical damage to fire, which is extremely good when you're at 90 over cap. This belt is super, super underrated. I think it's really, really powerful. But yeah, simple character, just build defenses, throw out storm blasts and portal mines, run around, loot the cards. Very, very straightforward. Anyways, that's it for all of the builds. Next up, I have a bunch of mapping statistics that you might find interesting. I took all of our map watch data from the previous four days, which encompassed all of our unID'd eight mod conch farming. And I've crunched the numbers just to provide you guys some interesting statistics here so in total over the four days of high juice mapping we ran a total of 221 maps of those 221 maps here we have 11 full bricks in which we all just kind of died instantly or early in the map 14 of those were half bricks which where we died maybe halfway through the map roughly which leads to a total of 196 full completions or 207 effective maps completed we also had an average of 0.7 deaths per map across all of our maps and the div card counts for doctors was 93 apothecary was 43 fiend was 31 unrequited love is 55 and fire of unknown origin which is the nimis card is at 53 one thing to note here about the nimis card is that this wasn't on 100 percent of the time it was being taken on and off in exchange for other cards so this drop rate would probably be a lot higher if we had it on 100 percent of the time so we have 0.42 doctors per map 0.19 apothecaries per map 0.14 fiends per map, 0.24 unrequiteds per map, and 0.32 fire of unknown origins per map. We were making approximately 1.7 doctors per hour, 0.8 apothecaries per hour, 0.57 fiends per hour, and 1.02 unrequited loves per hour, 0.98 fire of unknown origins per hour. Our average map time was 14.5 minutes. We spent a total time in the map of 3,213 minutes, which was 53 hours, and our average time in the map minus bricks was 15.13. Here are the average values of the cards in Divine 
divines per map, which means we were extracting a total of 22 divines per map in the five rarest cards alone. These aren't necessarily the most profitable cards, but these were the rarest cards that we were counting and have data for. Most likely, Fortunate and or Nurse is actually going to be providing more value than this, as Fortunate just has greater EV as well as Nurse over Doctor. And one last fun stat here is that our revenue per hour was 91 divines, just counting these five rare cards only. I'll put a link down to this sheet in the description if you're curious. You can look through all of the maps here. Basically, we just ran a majority of jungle valleys and some other stuff interspersed when we ran out. But yeah, there's a link if you want to just take a look at all the data. All right, that's it for all of the data, the stats, the build, all that kind of thing. I want to go on a little bit of a rant here now. So if you're looking for a constructive, whatever statistical analysis, that kind of thing, just leave now. From here on, it's just going to be my opinion. I'm just kind of talking about my experience with the current Atlas, some opinions, hot takes, that kind of thing. First thing I want to talk about is going to be the curation completion memes with all the quad div stacking. Now, obviously, it is very powerful and it is honestly kind of crazy that we're able to pull more divines per hour than an affliction, which it turns out when you can farm 12 maps simultaneously with all the different div cards, it is very, very, very powerful. On top of that, a bunch of the vertical stacking that you do within a mechanic is very, very powerful. And what I mean by that is the more scarabs you add of a particular type, the more and more powerful that your mechanic becomes. In our case, in six man farming, we are basically farming for maximum divination cards, right? So we just stack div scarab after div scarab after curation scarab after completion scarab. And every single scarab you add multiplies against the previous. And this is, I think, a problem that we're going to be experiencing in the new system of juicing in scarabs in the new Atlas here. It's obviously problematic when group players are shoving the prices of of these rarer scarabs to six, seven, eight, nine, ten divines for some of these rarer scarabs because obviously it is inaccessible for a lot of solo players. It's really easy for people to point to group players as being the sole issue for this, but I do think it highlights a greater issue in how the scarabs are designed as a whole, in that the price of these scarabs is going to be dictated by the highest possible thing you can extract out of them. And when the scarab supply is scarce, the scarabs are going to become more and more more stratified. That basically means is that the highest and most rare scarabs are just going to become exponentially expensive, which we've seen in the case of divination scarabs. And the more common scarabs where people aren't using are going to be just absolute trash because you're just overflowed with them. I do think currently the tuning on the rarity of these scarabs is way too rare. And I do hope that they're made more common and potentially less powerful. I think the margins on these maps are way, 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 way too high, even for six man. It is kind of ridiculous that we are able to to justifiably pay 10 or even 12 div investment in the map and we can happily walk out with maybe 30 or 40 divines and just profit out of that map. I think it might be a little bit healthier for the game to have a little bit lower cost of investment and then also a little bit lower returns, but the margins might stay, you know, roughly equal there. I do think that GGG has maybe taken the wrong approach to the tuning of these scarabs on the most recent hotfix where they made the curation scarab rarer. I do think it needs to be made way, way, way way, way more accessible and maybe nerf the power of it because it is quite a shame that they feel the need to make such a fun mechanic so rare because it is so powerful. I think a lot of people would be happier with something that costs a lot less and is abundantly available at the expense of not having it be such a high power level. I can talk about curation scarabs because obviously that's the thing that we farmed, but I do believe that this thing exists in almost all different categories of scarabs. If you look, for example, at harbinger scarabs, you start with a harbinger scarab and and then you add a multiplier by adding more harbingers. You add another layer, which is the rarer shards. You add another multiplier, which is the 50% chance for it to be replaced by a boss. And then you add another multiplier, which is currency shards are duplicated. And it's just multiplier on top of multiplier on top of multiplier on top of multiplier. And so if you aren't fully investing into these four scarab slots with the same mechanic, you are not extracting as much value as you should be. And when there is any scarcity in the market of these juicing supplies, it is just simply never going to make sense for you to casually throw any of these scarabs to juice your map. And I think that feels bad as a player. I think currently it might be an issue with that the scarabs are just too rare, even post hotfix, but that's just such a tough problem for GGG to solve. I, as a player, can really only point out the problem, but I do think that they'll come up with a clever solution for this, as GGG usually does. I think the main thing I'm trying to highlight is that the difference between the old scarabs and the new scarabs is that there's a lot more vertical farming going on. And 
it becomes less and less justified to put stuff like Harbinger Scarabs on your map when the price of Harbinger Scarabs are maybe something like 10 chaos because people are leveraging multiplier on top of multiplier on top of multiplier within Scarab categories. Whereas in the old system, you had a diversity of mechanics and the strongest thing you were putting on your map possibly was just a winged Scarab. But you had maybe three or four different things you were accessing. So now we're currently in a state where you're putting one thing on your map, but that one thing is just super broken and super juiced because of all the different multipliers you're putting onto it. Instead of having a bigger diversity of things you're putting on your map, be it, you know, four sextants and four scarab slots. Before you're putting Abyss, you're putting Breach, you're putting Reliquary, you're putting Div on, you know, end game juicer strats. And then you also had four sextants, which is adding Beyond and all of, you know, all of this kind of stuff. But it now feels like you're super stretched and you're pigeonholing yourself into just choosing one mechanic. And that one mechanic is the thing that you're hyper fixated on, which, you know, may or may not be a good thing. For me personally, I might prefer a slightly bigger diversity in the things that I'm investing in. I would like to see maybe a slightly larger diversity of mechanics on the map, uh, because for a lot of people, if you're doing all of these multipliers, multipliers, multipliers within a scarab category, you're simply just going to start skipping stuff that isn't being multiplied by having those four scarabs on your map. But yeah, there's definitely problems with the new scarabs in that people that are leveraging the high-end mechanics are pricing other people out of said strategies. And because the scarabs are so, 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 so rare that the scarcity caused by that causes the price of those scarabs to just go to the moon and are unaffordable and less attainable for a lot of players, which I think is a great shame because a lot of the mechanics that a lot of the scarabs adds are actually quite fun. It's a very hard problem to solve for GGG here, but I do think that there needs to be another iteration on the scarabs because the tuning just isn't quite right in my opinion. We have seen a huge nerf to end game MFing for solo and duo players. There isn't a whole lot of content that they can engage in. And I feel like I'm having flashbacks to Calandra because, you know, a lot of the end game MFing stuff that solo duo, maybe even smaller th trios were engaging with is just simply not obtainable. And I honestly just don't think that MFing is in a great state in 324 because it's either you're in a giant six man and you're just ricing cards, just shitting out all these different cards because you're able to invest 12 divs per map or your fub gun and despairing opening maps over and over fishing for divines because there's currently no viable MF strategy after the removal of Enraged. I'm sure GGG will figure it out. It is a big, big system overhaul with a lot of moving parts, uh, but unfortunately some things just get neglected, left in the dust, removed, and there isn't a great replacement for them. And I do think that MF in this case is in a pretty bad spot for solo duo players, but uh, I do think they're going to do another iteration on this, change some tuning, make it more affordable, that kind of thing. So I guess we'll just have to see where they take it next patch. Yeah, that's enough of the ranting. I had a very fun league. I do it all over again. I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have in the comments. A nice compilation video in the works of just all the big drops from this league. So take a look out for that. But yeah, once again, I'm Snap and thanks for watching. We'll see you next time, guys. Thanks.